Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers episode 24. I'm Ryan. I'm Amanda and we're your hosts. Yes, and today we're talking about Greece. Opa! <laughs> Is that where we smash a plate? <laughs> yes, um, we need to find some plate smashing and sound effects for later. But um, So we're talking about us going on a Kentucky tour in Greece, spe- specifically <laughs> of the Greek islands, Mykonos, Eos, and Santorini. Yeah, so we did a Greek island hopping tour. And that was actually the first Kentucky tour that we'd ever done before. That was, yes. Yeah, so do you want to give a little bit of background as to why we chose Kentucky, where that decision sort of came from? <sighs> yeah, I, it's weird because I thought Kentucky was like super popular, and I think it is pretty well known. But like a lot of people don't know what it is at the same time. Yeah, I think it just depends where you come from. I mean, it's super popular with Australians. Yeah. Like super, super popular in Australia. It's pretty big UK. Uh, what was that for? Oh. <laughs> there might be some Australians listening. Yeah, they're our favorite fans. <laughs> and we um, love them too. Um, so why we chose to go on a Kentucky tour we wanted, we had looked at, um, like when we were planning our trip to Europe, uh, we were like, oh, it'd be cool if we could, you know, put a tour in here somewhere. And we thought, we saw the Greek island hopping one, that really caught our eye because it was like, we don't really want to do a tour where it's a ton of sightseeing. And this tour is like a lot of partying, you meet people. And initially, we didn't really have a specific spot we wanted to put it into our itinerary. But um, just with the dates, it worked out well because we thought oh, we'd be in Greece towards the end of our three months in Europe. We could do that tour and then move on to Asia. Yeah, for sure. And I think for me, as sort of the planner of our duo, I was like, oh, it'd be great to have sort of a break from logistics. Like just not having to figure out when we have to take the ferries, where we have to stay. And after doing the trip, I was really happy to have that that break like it is nice to have somebody that's something you were thinking about at the time when we were booking yeah it's like i don't like i want to break from doing stuff like traveling is very different from vacationing in the sense that you are always there's always some logistical stuff to do like how many days did we spend kind of doing like administrative stuff just like planning hostels planning trains figuring out all the logistics of a trip yeah i guess beforehand i wasn't really like too I wasn't thinking much about how much effort that would require. Um, but I did think it would be cool to go on a tour just from the meeting people perspective. I remember beforehand thinking like, oh, it's going to be hard to meet people in hostels because I was a bit of a shy individual at that time. Um, so I was like, oh, if we go on a tour, we get to know people better. And that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, but there's, Kentucky is probably the biggest um tour company for young travelers isn't it um i think there's a lot of ones coming up like g adventures or what was gap adventures is pretty i think on par with kentucky free and easy traveler is a big one what's that hop on hop off bus in europe um i don't remember bus about. bus about yeah kind of the concept of like stray or kiwi experience in new zealand um kentucky's not huge in southeast asia I think free and easy traveler or a stray bus or a G adventures is a lot bigger, but in Europe, I think Kentucky probably takes, is probably the most popular in terms of tour companies. Yeah. Kentucky in Europe is uh, has a wide range of tours. My brother had done one and had lots of good things to say about it. Um, so we were both looking forward to it. I remember it was kind of like a bit nervous though, going to meet a tour group. It's kind of like going to school for the first day. I don't know if we, I don't think I was expecting to get along so well, not get along you and me, but just like get along in general with um, traveling on our own. Like I really enjoyed it, doing our own thing. So then coming, it's going to be changed. We've done three months of just, you know, occasionally hanging out with people in hostels, but not having this like group of people. And we're like, now we've got 14 days of people. What if I don't like them? What if they're mean to me? Yeah. Those kind of concerns. Yeah. That's definitely such an interesting thing that you just brought up because it just makes me think like when we did decide to travel together, I think I've said this in one of our very first podcasts, people were kind of like, Oh wow. Like traveling with a boyfriend, like that could go really poorly. 
And it's like, well, yeah, it could, but you never know until you do it. And things just did kind of, we fell into a really good rhythm. And I really liked not having anybody to, like, we kind of could just do our own thing, just you and I. And we did really fall into a really good rhythm. Yeah. And I've been thinking more about that, what you just said about, oh, you know, you can't travel. Traveling as a couple is hard. Um, logic as I'm, I'm writing something for the blog theworldwonders.com that'll come up in a while but um about like if you don't think you can travel with the person you're dating you probably shouldn't be dating that person i feel like a strong relationship is founded on an idea that you know you guys can handle whatever like you're better together um yeah no i completely like agree if, with if you that. Hand, if you you can't handle the apocalypse or you know traveling or anything that comes your way if you were like, oh, you know, I don't want to go traveling because it's very precarious now in this like generic cube work life I live, then maybe you should break up <laughs> yeah. instead of not going traveling. I think too, traveling is one thing that, you know, you and I have talked about just on our own and maybe with a few friends is that we have spent so much time together. Like when you just live together and you work a different job, you see your coworkers really more than you see your significant other who you may or may not live with. But traveling is really like we spent 12 hours every single day together. And even if we did stuff kind of individually or had like quiet time or, you know, weren't talking on a bus ride, it's still you're with that person and you really just get to know each other at a whole different level. Yeah. And it's really, um, it makes you think about how little time you actually do spend together when you've got full-time jobs, um, social, social lives. I can't talk today. Social lives independent of each other. And all this other stuff, you don't really spend that much time together. But uh, we're definitely going to have to delve into more relationship stuff on a future podcast. I was just going to say, are we talking about Kentucky or are we yeah, talking about traveling talking as a couple? Yeah, Greece, <laughs> Greece and Kentucky. So before I kind of took us off topic, we were talking about the feeling of meeting up with a tour group and how there's like all this anxiety about, you know, entering a new group of people. And it's kind of a weird thing to experience. It's definitely that first day of school feeling like it's kind of like, oh, what do I wear? How do I look? Like, what are people going to think of me? And And getting in a group is, uh, sorry to interrupt you, getting in a group is just very much, it's like, oh, now I have to introduce myself. Like, what do I say about myself? Like, what do people want to hear? Just a lot of like fear of what other people think, I think. Yeah, and it's tough because you do pay a lot of money for tours. Um, You can always do it yourself cheaper, I think. So I think that's pretty fair to say. I think that's fair to say. Um, if you're a, on a backpacker budget, I mean. Yeah, it's possible to do it cheaper. You don't necessarily always end up doing it cheaper. but um, you, So you pay a lot of money. And there's this big X factor of, are you going to like the people you're in the tour group with? Like, what if there's a bunch of douchebags? That's going to suck. And that we've had two experiences with Kentucky now. And it seems like douchebags don't usually take Kentucky tours. With the possible we, exception of one person, not on the Greece tour. <laughs> we had one incident with an individual who was a bit of a D bag, but yeah, no, it seems like you kind of get like minded people on the tour and again it's it's part of travel. You meet people who are just different from yourselves and you're put in a situation where you have something in common and you kind of just get along and it's it's fun. I like that. And there's yeah, there's people you connect with more, people you connect with less, and you can kind of you know hang out with those people and the one thing that was beautiful about the tour we went on was that it was very un um, unstructured so a lot of kentucky tours in europe are go 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 oh we've got to see this um we're going to hit like 17 cathedrals and then we're going to party all night and camp outside the city and then like 14 more cathedrals the next day (laughs) and then party camp cathedrals um so maybe (laughs) something other than a cathedral there's not probably a town town square (laughs) Maybe the only other thing, but um, so the island hopping it was like party and then relax. It was like and then like the beach, every like third day we beach. Moved. Yeah, it was good. Um, one thing about Kentucky is that so on your very first night you get the tour leader goes through a list of optional activities that you have to pay extra for. Um, some of them are meals. Some of them are actual you know, activities. And the hard thing with being in a group is that when everybody else is doing it, it's really hard to say no to these things. And you've already spent so much money on the tour. I mean, it's really not a budget friendly option. I don't think. 
Yeah, and it's not. It's I wouldn't I don't want to say it's deceptive, but it's not like they're not being very upfront about the costs. Um, well, I mean, they do say like minus a few, like they tell you what meals are included and they say you have to pay for additional meals and additional activities. I just don't think it's clear as somebody who's never done it before what additional activities means. Cause to me that means, okay, we're doing all this stuff as a group. If I want to go to a market on this Saturday, cause I'm interested in that, I pay for my own transportation there and anything I buy there. That's to me what additional activity is. Whereas it's not, okay, we're going to do this as a group who wants to come. Yeah. And because they are group activities, on both the tours we've done almost everyone goes um, there are things that you really, really feel like you're missing out on and so there are things that could be included but they that would jack up the initial price and probably people wouldn't pay to do the tour off the top if they saw this bigger lump sum at the start yeah it's such a tough situation that it's like you know even when you do go for these dinners it's like you everybody gets drinks there are a lot of additional prices like it's not like going to cancun for a week all inclusive and really having everything included it's not like that and then choosing like if you want to leave the resort for a nice dinner it's it's not you wouldn't wouldn't expect it to be like that you'd expect to pay for other things but you would kind of expect maybe a little bit more stuff to be included during the tour. Mm -hmm. So our tour went from Athens back to Athens with stops in Mykonos, Santorini, and Eos. Yeah, three of the, I guess, most popular Greek islands. I would say say. those are the most popular ones. (laughs) Just because you've been there. I've been to these three. I think Santorini is the most popular. Yeah, for sure. Mykonos is pretty popular and Eos also very popular. Different crowds for all the islands though. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So Santorini is a very popular spot for cruises. It's spectacularly beautiful. Um, It's on like the outside of a volcanic crater. So there's this big uh, kind of cliff and you just get spectacular sunsets. Um, But definitely more of like a a family vacation spot, an older tourist vacation spot. I think Santorini would be a beautiful honeymoon spot. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit bigger island, so there's like, I think there's wineries and a few things you can do on the island. <laughs> Clearly we didn't do any of those You're things. You're doing a lot of drinking. <laughs> um, Mykonos, uh, famous for being one of the top gay getaway spots in the world. Yeah, you see that? Yeah, That's also it. very popular with italian people it seems who like to wear speedos <laughs> and mykonos is cool like there's a very big uh like club scene lots of like gigantic clubs and big musicians going and playing at the clubs there i think there's like some sort of cave club venue yeah lots of djs on. as well yeah um and then eos is kind of like a backpacker island i would say like a lot of not mega clubs like in Mykonos, although there are some big clubs there. Um, More bars. Yeah, and lots of little bars all doing like their distinct thing. But Eos, it's a smaller island and it really has been taken, like kind of hollowed out by tourism in a way. Like it seems like that's the only thing going on there. Yeah, the island actually shuts down from, I think, middle to end of September through till May, April. It's just kind of like closed down, basically. Like the ferries don't run there. There's not that many locals that live there. There's kind of one main road that runs from one end of the island to the other. And there's a bunch of resorts, a few hostels, and a ton of bars. And like a kebab shop. (laughs) A kebab shop, of course. (laughs) Has to be a kebab shop. Um, We started out in Athens, though. And Athens was definitely different. Yeah, and it was turbulent times in Greece in 2011. Um, their government was going through a major debt crisis, which I think they haven't really resolved in any major way. So there had been like gigantic riots, and the city was um, grungy and a little bit crazier than any thing we'd seen in the rest of Europe so far. Yeah, I've talked to a few friends who have thought was one friend in particular, one of my good friends. She started out a three month backpacking trip in Athens, and she absolutely absolutely hated it it was her Mm. first place that she'd ever been into europe and she was like what am i doing like this is crazy yeah we came in with we'd heard some bad things from people so i think we came in with low enough expectations that we both kind of enjoyed it 
Yeah, I mean, so it's grungy. Like we saw a lot of prostitutes on the streets, kind of where we were staying the first night. Lots of stray dogs. Druggy looking folks. Yeah, it's not. Got some weird harassment from police officers. It's definitely not like the Paris of Europe by any means. (laughs) It's the Bangkok of Europe. (laughs) It's the Bangkok of Europe. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is a little bit more poor, but I mean, Greece is a poorer country, so you need to keep that in perspective. Like it's not, it's not France. Um, Going to see the ruins in Athens was so cool. Yeah. Um, Parthenon. Acropolis. I think the Parthenon's at the Acropolis. Yeah. The Parthenon and the Acropolis. I mean, I love the movie Hercules when I was younger. So it was pretty cool to actually see that in person after watching that movie like hundreds of times. <laughs> and the time frame on those is crazy. It was weird going from like, you went, um, you're in Europe and you're like, wow, this shit's old. And then you go to Italy and Rome, you're like, holy fuck, this shit's old. And then you go to Greece and you're like, wow, it's even older than that old shit. Well, I mean, it's, it's weird going from somewhere like you see the Edinburgh castle and you're like, wow, like this is a castle, like a really old castle from like the 15th or the 1500s, 15th century, 16th century. And then you go to, I think I just confused that in my head, um, 1500s, 1600s, 14th, 15th century. And then you... No, the 15th century is the 1400s. The 16th century is the 1500s. Okay, I was right the first time then. Just don't worry about me. It's old. And then you go somewhere like Rome, and yeah, it's just so old. Go to Greece, and it's so much older. And it's in really good shape. They've done a lot of, a really good job at fixing it up. Yeah. It's weird with the old sites and restoration work. What do you think about that? Does it make it less authentic? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, it was interesting. I was talking to my parents last week because they just went to, did a tour up the Seine River from Budapest up to uh, somewhere in Germany. And they were just talking about how some of the ruins they saw in Hungary and some of the other places in Eastern Europe weren't restored the same way and they could tell that it was a poorer country. I was kind of like, well, does it need to be restored? Like, does it need to be? It's kind of cool to just see it how it is. Well, it's not really ruins if you rebuild it. It's not really old if you rebuild it. It's like something that was old that you've made change to make it how it would have been back in the day. Yeah, and it's like, I know when we went to Machu Picchu, they're talking about how there was restoration work happening. And it's like, well, I don't know how I feel about that. Because they're obviously not going to build it up to be what it was because they don't really know what it was. But also they have want to keep this ruiny look, but they want to like kind of spruce up the ruins. It's tough because are people going to pay money to go and see something that's just like a pile of rubble? Or will people pay to see something that is an actual building and they're like, oh, this is what it looks like. Like people love that. So, I mean, it goes both ways. Yeah. But back to the Parthenon. Um, very cool site. The one thing if you are going to watch out for is um, since Athens is a very popular destination for cruise ships, so we kind of got lucky. We went in, it was a little bit quiet, and then I think it got smashed by cruise ships as soon as we left. But we talked to some other people who went and were just like, it was unbearable how many people were there because all of like a thousand people from a cruise ship will show up at one point. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, <laughs> lots of cruise ship tourism which is just not my thing at all but it's still worth it to do the walk up it's pretty affordable to go see the acropolis and hear about the history the history is very cool um i think we got slushies at the acropolis too some sort of like frozen lemonade drink (laughs) (laughs) key memory from visiting the acropolis was getting a a lemonade segue into the food which might have been my favorite thing about Greece in general. And I think that's when I think about Athens, I think about just having some spectacular food. Yeah. I was going to say, I think the food in Greece was in my top three of everywhere we went. Yeah. I'd say Greek food may be my favorite food right behind sushi. Um, But I going into Greece, I wasn't really that big of a fan. Like I was like, Oh yeah, Suvlaki. That's good. I like tzatziki. 
It's uh, like, oh, I like opa fries. They're pretty tasty. Yeah, but I just fell in love with olives and feta and... The tomatoes. Yeah, to- yeah, yeah. Olives. Oh, Tzatziki you said olives. Well. <laughs> Dolomites. Um, you know, pretty much all of it. Moussaka, I'm not like sold on. Um, yeah, dolomites with tzatziki, which are the the grape leaves with rice and I think some beef inside of them. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if they traditionally have meat inside of them. I don't. The ones you get here usually don't. Yeah, I can't remember. I just remember them being delicious. We had a lot of really good meals in Greece, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the olive oil. Oh my gosh, Greek salad, calamari. Just everything. It's so delicious yeah, there. Yeah, I'm getting hungry and <laughs> wanting to go to Greece. My same good friend who went to Greece, she was a really picky eater when she went because she was like 18 at the time. And she said that one of the things she regrets is that she didn't like any of the food. She would get like a like chicken and pita. She's like, I didn't eat the feta. I didn't eat the tomatoes. I was like, girl, you missed out. <laughs> yeah, it's spectacular food. And I, I hadn't had many experiences where I'd really changed my perspective a whole lot because I really didn't like Greek salad before I went to Greece. And then I fell in love with it there. And the tough thing is, is that after having Greek food in Greece, it's just not the same anywhere else. Yeah, especially the cheese. It seems like it's really hard to get feta cheese comparable outside of Greece because of... Well, we have like crazy laws about cheese in Canada. So I think that is part of it for sure. They have unpasteurized cheese. Yeah, I think that's one of the key parts. I think feta is traditionally goat's cheese and it's unpasteurized. Yeah, and it's amazing too because you get a piece that's like the size of a small paperback book on top of your Greek salad. And you're like, whoa, this is too much cheese to eat. But it's just so good you can't stop. I think this is a reoccurring theme with Ryan and I. Ryan and I like food if anybody wants to go for a meal yeah. with us. I mean, think about um, like there's these, like if you've heard of the Silk Road, there's these websites on the dark net where you can buy illegal things, drugs, all this other crazy stuff. I wonder if maybe you can buy some unpasteurized feta cheese. Isn't that closed down now, the Silk Road? Oh, there's a new one. Okay. There's like 17 new ones that have opened up and are like... I'm better. sure on one of them you could buy unpasteurized <laughs> cheese if you were to get that shipped to your house, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, we're continuing on from Athens. <laughs> Our first stop was Mykonos. Is that where you want to go? Yeah, let's go to Mykonos. Um, one of the great things about Kentucky is that you stay in pretty nice places. So you definitely... You pay a bit more, but you do stay more in hotels. So it's nice for Ryan and I. We had a private room to stay together in. And I mean, I, I, I don't want to go backwards, but going back to Athens, we'd been in hostels for three months. And I remember getting a hotel room that had like its own bathroom and just being so excited. <laughs> yeah. And then it was nice to continue two weeks of like, oh yeah. It's like one of those things where you're like, I can spread my crap out and walk around naked. <laughs> like I haven't done yeah. this. Like just the little There's pleasures in life. And you're like, what? Yeah. Um, so Mykonos... I was a really cool island. Um, I think, I don't know if it was my favorite. I had a good time on EOS, but Mykonos, I think, might have been my favorite. Santorini was mine. <laughs> yeah, maybe Santorini. It's one of the three for sure. It was cool because in Mykonos, we stayed at this hotel that had a pool. So it was just like really good place to get to know our group. We all hung out at the pool all day. We didn't really do much in Mykonos. It was just mostly pool days. We did a toga night one night just at our resort. Had another Kentucky group come over there, which was fun. And then another night we went out clubbing. It was kind of like a dress up night. And then a third night we did like a beach day at Paradise Beach. Is that what it was called? I'm not sure. But yeah, one of these like world famous beach clubs. It's crazy. You go and you get a table during the day and you just start like day drinking while the sun's up and um, they set it up. You're sitting on these like benches with pillows on them and then you go at like three and around like 6 p.m. They remove all the pillows so that everybody can get up on the benches and dance, which is just such a cool concept. Massive stage guy in a banana speedo that's just covering what needs to be covered who's like announcing and djs and it was just a crazy time yeah and i remember there was these like middle eastern guys who must have just been rolling in money with like tons and tons of bottles of champagne and yeah it's interesting it's like champagne and strawberries and cream 
is like shows you have well so you just have like these big bottles on your like hundreds and hundreds of maybe even thousands of euros for the bottles of champagne it's interesting because it's kind of like that aspect of it really reminds me of the way clubs are in vegas but this is so casual like so many people are just in their bathing suits sundresses like this is what are the italians and their speedos like anything Uh, goes there like it's not it's like if you picture a club in Vegas with like that's the bottle have, service, like, but at like wooden that's they have tables. Those, like, big pool parties in Vegas. Even those are like way fancier than what this is. It's just like a different. I don't know. It's weird. I guess it's because it's just in the sand with like wooden tables. But yeah, I guess like pool party essentially, minus the pool plus the ocean. Mm-hmm. And then from there we went on to Santorini, and we kind of things kind of cooled down for a couple of days in Santorini. Yeah, like we said before, Santorini is definitely more, there's more families there. I think it is a really popular honeymoon spot. We kind of stayed a little bit out of the town. So we had, I don't know, a 10 minute walk. I get another place with a pool, which was cool. We had an interesting experience in Santorini. We actually rode some donkeys. Oh God, I'd forgotten about that. How horse, did you forget yeah. about that? Did yeah. you just suppress it's that like memory? It's, it's a repressed <laughs> memory for me. So there's this pathway um, of stairs that lead up. What is that called? The Cordillera? Whatever uh, the cliff is that's caused from being on the edge of a crater. There's a staircase up. And you can apparently ride donkeys up. It's not really a staircase. It's kind of like a pathway that yeah. kind of winds. And it's not really like riding. It's like... <laughs> Putting your life in the hand of a donkey. <laughs> yeah. Um, in Gre- yeah. Anyways. So you get down there. I was kind of expecting like maybe there'd be a saddle. Like maybe there's someone to kind of guide you up. There's just like kind of an assembly line. of like a line of donkeys. A platform. And they're just like hop on the donkey and then they just kind of whack it and then the donkey just takes off. Yeah, you pay five euros for it. So you like hand over your five euro bill. You, they like get you on this donkey. You just like jump on it and they whack it in the butt and then you're, you just kind of go and you just do as the donkey wants to do. And like my donkey wanted to be the head of the pack. So I pretty much was charged up the hill. Whereas Ryan's donkey was really hungry the whole time and kept stopping to eat grass um fairly ridiculous fairly terrifying yeah and at the end it was worse because the don- donkey's kind of on like a donkey mosh pit and then you're just like in the middle completely surrounded by circle or encircled by donkeys and then like the greek people are like yelling at you like get off get off get off because they want to take all the donkeys back down the hill and, and there's all these other people walking down the hill um, while this like donkey chaos is just coming up the hill and they're getting angry because donkeys are running them off the road <laughs> My donkey in particular. People are just like cursing at me. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm not in control of this donkey. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's scary too. You get at the top and you kind of have to like slide off the donkey, avoid the donkey poo. And then, I mean, the one thing that I know about donkeys is that donkeys kick. So it's like, I don't want to be behind a donkey's butt and have a donkey kick me and break my ribs. So it's like, then you're kind of like backing away while trying not to get trampled by other donkeys. It's just... It's scary, to be quite honest. Yeah. And one of the cool things on a different note was um, Greece was the first place we'd been with uh, where it seemed like uh, counterfeit stuff was just everywhere. Uh, and we noticed a few spots in Europe, but like there, like there's just all sorts of stores with fake sunglasses, fake watches, fake clothing, and they're all like branded as um, the actual brands. Mm hmm which was like a nice introduction to what it was going to be like in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think Greece was definitely a good place to stop over before going to Asia. It kind of <laughs> gave us like a small taste of what Asia yeah, would be like. Yeah, there was like. a lot of characteristics similar and just the craziness, especially on the roads, um, driving. Yeah, everything's just kind of a bit more free-flowing. No one really follows the rules. Lots more counterfeit stuff. Um, dangerous. You're going to have to take more responsibility for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then our last stop was Eos. And like we mentioned before, Eos is a big party spot, a big backpacker place. And one of the cool things about Eos is there's just probably, I don't know, 30, 40 bars in this like tiny little downtown core. It seems like almost every second um, store is a bar. And so they've all tried to differentiate themselves by doing this weird, crazy stuff. Yeah, so what are the, some of the things that we did? So the, the one that, that comes to did. mind is there is one called the Smasher Bar or Slammer Bar? 
hammer bar. So they have the slammer shot there where they put a shitty motorcycle helmet on your head and then pour you a shot of, um, it's like a gigantic shot, I think of like seven up and something. Well, they do a drop shot, it's something yeah. in seven up. And as they drop it, you have to, they hit you on the head with like a hammer or something. Or like some type of fire extinguisher or a chair. Yeah, and then you have to chug your drop shot, which just sounds like, saying this out loud just like makes people, me feel like, are, like, are you stupid? No, yeah. I'm not stupid. You just get but, caught up in it. Yeah, but it's like, you know, how are we going to get people to come to the bar? Let's, oh, let's, let's, let's physically abuse them. <laughs> let's that, hit them on the head. <laughs> that'll make these idiot Australian and North American Canadians come. The Canadians love it when you get physically abused at a bar. <laughs> and it's true. Like, that's probably the most popular bar. Yeah, Could there's... Uh, I think Orange Bar is up there. Orange Bar is pretty cool because you can buy, like, I don't know, for a certain price, you get a whole bunch of shots, and then all their shots are different flavors. So there's, like... But that's the same. What even because are there? There's like there's a like shooter bar, flames bar, where they like the shots on fire. Um, and one of the cool things is that they all have these deals. If you spend a little bit more money to get more alcohol, they give you a singlet. And so we just, oh, how much money did we drop? I don't even want to know. Yeah, I remember doing my budgeting count and we spent like $2,000 on the Kentucky trip, 14 days. Maybe a bit more than that. And I spent a comparable amount of money on drinking <laughs> because like it's not cheap and you, so we would go out like every night and just take out heaps of euros I remember afterwards being like oh god <laughs> that was yeah bad. yeah no it is and that's that's definitely like a con of Kentucky I would say is that it is expensive and the thing with it is is that you get a lot of people who are just over on a vacation yeah, so we met so. a lot of people who are literally on a two-week vacation with siblings friends significant others and so they've paid for this and they're just living it up and that's that's fine yeah. but it's you know as long-term budget backpackers it's how do you separate yourself from that and say no yeah so we had um like you just mentioned it but like Kentucky is very popular for just going out and doing a trip and all you're doing is Kentucky tour. So for the people who are doing that, the the budget is just way different than the budget you're on. For us, like we've been trying to travel for six months. And when you get into a group situation like that, you do really want to fit in. Like we were enjoying hanging out with all the people we'd met and we don't want to be like, oh, you know, we're just going to go out one time because the whole point of going on the Kentucky tour for us was to get closer with people, to build stronger relationships and to go out and have a lot of fun because we didn't really do that in the other parts because we were kind of more interested in seeing things, experiencing things. So this was really about, you know, having that kind of like traditional fun, <laughs> traditional going out fun. and spending money, but it is expensive. Yeah, I mean, Kentucky for us was kind of a vacation from our travels, and that is where we made it. But at the same time, like, you know, we sacrificed other things to be able to do that because we did spend a lot of money there. Yeah, and it becomes, you get kind of caught up in this like sunk cost bias where it's like, oh, I paid $2,000 to be on the tour. I should probably pay the extra $500 to do these bonus activities. And then like the same version of that decision making. Oh, you know, we could not go out tonight, but then like we paid, you know, $2,500 for the tour and the bonus activities. Like we should probably just spend like the 60 bucks it requires to go out tonight. And then it's like, oh, like I'll just take this much money out and then I'll stop drinking. Like I won't get a drunk snack. And then like, you just take out more cash because people are still drinking and then everybody goes to the kebab shop and it smells delicious and you know, it tastes good. So then you get that too. And you're like, whatever, I'll worry about it tomorrow. <laughs> it's just, it's kind of a bad cycle that you get into in a situation like that. Um, that's one of the negative things about it in the same end, spending, you know, two weeks with people on the other hand, I said in the same end, is that not a thing? I don't think that's a thing. Okay. <laughs> just speaking of Amanda over here um, <laughs> um, one of the pros of Kentucky is that you do have the opportunity to get to know people at a different level and for us we met a lot of people in Greece that we actually ended up staying with in Australia which was really cool yeah you we've talked about it quite a few times on other episodes but when you're traveling and you spend a couple of days with someone you really get close and so if to spend 14 days with this group of people um it really created some like stronger bonds with 
people like people we still talk to today. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have, there's people that we visited in Australia since then we've had two people from that Kentucky come and visit us in Canada. It really is an opportunity to make friends around the world and, you know, you're on the same route. So it's not like you meet somebody, you know, you spend a few days with them in a city, you really have a good relationship with them and you want to continue it, but they're going in a different direction than you. Like you're kind of in this situation where you're on the same route. And it's nice too, because it kind of takes some of the travel stressors away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The logistical problems are removed and you can kind of focus on just enjoying yourself. Yeah, for sure. I think too, like Kentucky isn't necessarily, I don't know, as like a couple and as two people, I don't think that Kentucky is something that we needed to do. I think it's a great option though as a solo traveler for sure. Yeah. And we've kind of felt that at times too, about being like a couple on a, because a lot of people do go there to try to like hook up with girls and I mean, everyone's there to party. So yeah. And you do kind of get that stigma attached like, Oh, you're a couple. You don't like to have fun. And it's like, mm, just cause we're dating doesn't mean we're boring. <laughs> Like we do like to have fun. It's fine. Yeah. But the, to that, to that end, like I don't really like to have that kind of fun anymore. Going out and drinking and engaging in kind of self-destructive behavior. I don't think it's something I don't know that I don't think I don't do that anymore. Really. Yeah, no. And that's completely fine. Um, would you recommend Kentucky for solo travelers? Like yeah, somebody, absolutely. somebody planning a and trip by themselves? We've talked about this a few times, but it's a cool way to get introduced to an area. Um, like if you're nervous about going on a trip and you can go on a tour for the first little bit, you kind of build that comfort zone without having getting overwhelmed. Like we talked a lot about this when we were in Asia. When we flew, we kind of left our Kentucky tour in Greece and went to Asia and be like, wow, it'd be nice if we had done a tour for our first two weeks in Asia, because you're really outside of your comfort zone and having a tour guide who's kind of looking out for you, um, planning the logistics of things. It helps you get into a comfort zone with some things and then you can kind of take on more responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I know when we were in, we were in South America and we did a Kentucky tour for a carnival in Rio. Um, and there was lots of people there who just on vacation again, but it would be, that'd be a cool way to start a trip in South America. If you were on a Kentucky tour in Europe, I don't think people have the same reservations about um, feeling overwhelmed and out of their comfort zone as much. I think that like, if you are a solo traveler who's never, ever traveled before, I think you definitely do have reservations even going to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it's a cool way because you do, um, you, if you go on a tour, like you'll probably meet some people who are hanging around afterwards. So you, you build a bit of a network of folks who may be traveling. Yeah. A good way to make a travel buddy for continuing on or even, you know, p maybe people have come from other places and you can find out where they've been and, you know, it's just a good way to kind of get some more information, meet some people. Great way to make connections around the world for sure. Like I think we have friends in a lot of different areas in the world that we, you know, we have stayed with, we would stay with again. We w would welcome them into our home. For sure. Yeah. And just to kind of wrap up the actual tour we were on. So we went from Santorini back to Athens, had one night there, and then kind of carried on. And it was a pretty sad time. But they, we gotten really lucky with the group of people we were with. Um, it was a really nice group, and it was kind of sad to be moving on. And we were also kind of getting some like, oh, God, we're going to Southeast Asia, panic. <laughs> yeah, I think that the stress of going somewhere that we really neither of us was familiar with at all was definitely stressful. So would you recommend the Greek island hopping tour with Kentucky to people? Yeah, definitely. I don't think that I would do it again. I think that it's kind of like been there, done that in terms of that exact tour. I think it's an absolutely amazing way to see the Greek islands. It takes out so much of that logistical stuff. I mean, Greek is a very different language from English. They have a whole different alphabet. A lot of people don't speak English there. So it just took, you know, it made things a lot easier for us. If you're looking for sort of like a vacation, but like a fun vacation with a group of people, Kentucky is definitely something I would recommend. Um, good way to meet some people, get out there, see some stuff, not see too much stuff and have a good time. Yeah. And then so the Greek islands, 
that's somewhere you'd go back to? Yeah, for sure. I think that I would love to go back to the Greek islands. And we'd heard like lots of good things about other smaller islands that aren't necessarily on like the big, the big three or whatever. So I'd love to go back and check out some more of the other islands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to just and get a bit of a more authentic experience. Oh, I'd love to just spend a month like in my bathing suit, getting super yeah. brown and eating It'd Greek really, salad. Yeah, to go out to like a random <laughs> small Greek island where you're just gonna like hang out for a month, that'd be pretty awesome. Oh, uh, hang out with like a like a Greek grandma. I feel like old women in Greece just make the best food. Maybe that's just from Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Though that I assume that. Maybe. <laughs> Anyways, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, anywhere that you want to hear about, uh give us an email at send us an email at the world wanders podcast at gmail.com. Check out the show notes at www.theworldwanders.com. And if you are listening on iTunes, um, the ratings and reviews um, for the podcast on iTunes are extremely helpful. So if you did like what you were listening to, or even if you didn't find it that great uh, rating and a review on iTunes would be amazing. Yeah. Positive or constructive. We don't like negative though. Yeah, we'll take a minute. Constructive. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Until next time. <laughs>